From Bowling Green State University and the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society, this is BG Ideas. I'm going to show you this with a wonderful experiment. You're listening to the Big Ideas Podcast, a collaboration between the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society and the School of Media and Communication at Bowling Green State University. I'm Jolie Sheffer, Professor of English and American Culture Studies and the Director of ICS. As always, the opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of BGSU or its employees. Bowling Green State University and its campuses are situated in the Great Black Swamp and the Lower Great Lakes region. This land is the homeland of the Wyandot, Kickapoo, Miami, Potawatomi, Ottawa, and multiple other indigenous tribal nations, present and past, who were forcibly removed to and from the area. We recognize these historical and contemporary ties in our efforts toward decolonizing history, and we thank the indigenous individuals and communities who've been living and working on this land from time immemorial. Today, I have the pleasure of talking about the brave new world of chat GPT and artificial intelligence with Drs. Neil Baird and Kitty Burroughs. Neil is the director, and Kitty is the associate director of the University Writing Program here at BGSU. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for the invite, and it's great to be here with you. Thank you. Can you start by telling us a little bit about the University Writing Program and your responsibilities in your respective positions? So, Neil, I'll have you start. Yeah, so I direct the university writing program, and it's responsible for our first year writing courses here at BGSU, which is Writ 1110, a seminar in academic writing, and Writ 1120, a seminar in research writing. How many students take those courses each year? Most of our incoming students take it. I think we have upwards of 80 to 100 sections a semester. Yeah. And Kitty can talk a little bit more about our co-rec experience. Good. Right. As an associate director of university writing program, I work with instructors who teach our writing courses, whether it is with course design or with assessment. And a majority of my responsibility is with the writing 1010 experience to get students familiar with academic writing and this is our most vulnerable group on campus who are taking our writing course. So these students need a lot of assistance. Hmm. We've been hearing a lot in the news about chat GPT and AI, both good, bad, and a lot of fear and uncertainty. Can you talk a little bit about what each of those terms means and why these tools are provoking consternation on college campuses? I think one of the things that we would like to help listeners understand is that AI has been with us for a little while now, right? Just think of Grammarly, right? Or even items in Google Docs where you have it help you make your wording a little bit more concise, right? And even Microsoft's Grammar and, and, and spell check. Those are artificial intelligence tools, right? Where chat GPT is, is new and is creating quite a frenzy is that it's an artificial intelligence that actually generates writing. I would like to add to that so ChatGPT is really an AI language model, and it was designed to generate human-like text in a conversational context. So it is also generative. This means it has the ability to learn patterns and structures of human conversation as it gathers information from the internet, as well as as it converses with participants who ask questions. Yeah. I just add, like, along with learning, GPT-4 is going to come out really soon, and it's, it's more of a paid product. I think it's $20 a month, but, you know, incredible. Like, you can essentially sketch out the ideas for a website on a napkin and take a photo of it, and it will create a website based on that napkin. So just incredible the ways in which it kind of generates web text and, and writing. Kitty, can you give an example of, I don't know if you've played around with it. I've been reading about the way people have played with it. Could you talk folks through who might not have experimented themselves, sort of the parameters you can set and what kinds of things it can generate? Right. So I've taken some time at the beginning of the year to explore and learn more about ChatGPT. And this is how it works. You would provide it with a prompt or a question, 
and then it would then generate a response based on its understanding of the context and the patterns it has learned from the internet and from previous conversations with participants. So currently, the text it generates is very generic. Mm. It's very much on the surface level. Some would even say that it's robotic, but it has a generative feature, and it has the ability to learn over time. So it does get smarter. And over time, it means that the language model will become more accurate and more human-like over time. So you can ask it questions, or you can say, you know, summarize for me, you know, what happened in Selma in 1963, or or whatever your prompt is, right? And it'll gather together information from Wikipedia, wherever else it's searching right. on a website, and will spit out some version of a, if you've asked for a summary, it'll summarize. But then you can follow up, ask it or tell it follow up prompts, right? And we both experimented with it. Maybe we can talk a little bit about what we did. But I think, you know, Kitty's is particularly fascinating because it was, Kitty was asking it to do reflective writing. So I'm very specific with my assignments for the students in my writing classes. So I personalize those assignments and ask my students to integrate their own experiences and their reaction to specific reading assignments. So if even if students use ChatGPT and ask a question, say, a, a summary of Malcolm X article on learning to read, it would just spit out a generic summary of that article. It does not have the more human-like qualities like creativity, curiosity. It definitely does not have students' unique experiences. It'll give you the Cliff Notes version, right? Like it's capable of that. Right. But my assignments ask students to also contribute and share their personal experiences in relation to a reading assignment. So that is something that AI, at at least at this time, does not have the ability to, to do. Neil, could you talk us through what are some of the ways in which this tool could become an issue in education? So especially like in university writing courses. Again, we hear folks freaking out about this a bit. What is the concern and how are you thinking about it? Yeah. So Elizabeth Wardle, who is one of our colleagues at uh, Miami University, has a concept called a mutt genre, right? It's essentially a, a school genre that has no kind of representative purpose other than, you know, school, right? And I think if you are really asking your students to engage in school genres and genres, right, what will happen is that students could put a version of the prompt into ChatGBT and have it generate something and, and sort of have it be passed off on its own. So there's real fear of, of plagiarism or probably more aptly named maybe academic dishonesty mm-hmm. that folks are, are kind of really, really fearful of. And this sort of follows on the heels of conversations about students buying papers, paying right. for papers, things like that. So this, for many folks, this is sort of another frontier in that debate. Yes, right? yes. Okay. Have we seen any of this happen already on campus? Kitty? A few of our instructors have collected student writing that they suspect was generated through ChatGPT. So we are in conversations about how to broach that topic with students. One of the things we talked about in our recent meeting, a staff meeting with uh, all all faculty in the writing program is to be transparent with our students about our position in terms of how we would use AI in the classroom, especially in writing, and also to think more deeply about how we design our courses and our assignments. So we are still, I would say, we're still in, you know, deep conversation about the topic. I'd say we've had within the university writing program only one instance of a faculty member 
bringing charges of academic dishonesty against the student. But we encourage our faculty to meet with the student to learn more about intentions behind those kinds of things and learning kind of what the student did, decided not to kind of bring any kind of academic dishonesty charges towards the student. So, Because well, part of what you're talking about, I think, Kitty, this is what you were saying, is that, you know, this, these are our new students and often kind of our more vulnerable students, right? Some students may test out of some of these writing courses. And so it's a lot of students, thousands of students taking these classes, but part of it is they're new to the university and new to some genres of writing, Right. Right. And so part of the work of UWP is not only to teach them the skills, but also to acculturate them to what are the rules for being part of an academic community. What is academic dishonesty? What are the practices that are okay, and what are the ones that are not? So how is that already kind of a part of the curriculum in some of these courses? So within our writing program, we do have a policy of a very brief statement that we, all instructors would incorporate in their syllabus. Essentially, it starts with, you know, it is so tempting for students to want to find a shortcut to writing. But our advice is that in a writing classroom, it is very difficult for machines to produce the kind of writing we're asking our students to do. So we ask our students to focus on the writing process and to emphasize curiosity, creativity, critical thinking that AI cannot produce and cannot duplicate. And we also are very transparent. We do share with students in the statement that new AI programs allow instructors to detect academic dishonesty. In short, we ask our students to be genuine and honest with their writing assignments, because in the long run, it can only help them transfer the knowledge they learn in our writing classrooms to other writings on campus. Yeah, I'd add that, you know, one of the things we can't escape is the impact of writing technologies on the process of writing. And so I think our faculty is are really good at sort of helping students explore that, right? You know, here's spell checker, right? Here's what it does really well. Here's what it doesn't do really well. Uh, mm-hmm. Here's how you can use it to kind of support, you know, your writing. You know, here's Google Docs, right? If you hover over a, a phrase that's underlined, it will give you some options for how to make it more concise, right? But, you know, you're in control and you have to decide kind of what's the most appropriate move forward in terms of revising that. So, you know, in general, we understand that writing technologies deeply impact the writing process and we're kind of really good at helping students understand ethical uses of technology. Now we just have to do the same thing for chat GPT. Yeah. And it really what you're talking about is it's a new tool, yeah. right? And, and using tools means you have to understand when and how to use it appropriately. I mean, I think your examples of like spell check are great, right? Mm-hmm. Because it, it won't detect if it's a homonym that is also yes. spelled correctly, but exactly. that is not the word you mean, right? Exactly. So you still have to engage in a lot of the writing and revision process um, right. to make sure that you're communicating what you want to communicate. Right. I would add, too, that I share with my students that I am less interested in fighting or policing the use of this technology. And I share with my students as often as I can that I am really interested in understanding this tool and to looking into ways of how my students and I can use this tool to help them learn, specifically learn about how writing works, how writing works for each of them, And that is to say that there is another way of looking at generative AI, right? And that this tool can be an aid to our students' learning and for instructors to use it as a teaching aid. Yeah, I'd add that we're, I think we'd like to create spaces in which students can kind of share with us how they've used ChatGPT to support the writing that they're pushing forward, right? which requires kind of a safe space in order to be able to share that, right? But long term, we'd like to learn from students, you know, informally asking them is is about how they're using chat GPT in the classroom is kind of an informal way, but we'd like to push forward a more formal kind of research project that explores how students are using it, right? And also explores how 
like recent graduates are potentially using it as well, right? I don't know about you, but I reuse writing a lot. You know, my plagiarism statement in my syllabus is plagiarized, <laughs> right? You know, we reuse writing all the time, right, as professionals. And so I'm curious to see how professionals use ChatGPT to take up their own writing in their professions, but also, you know, how students do that as well. Yeah, I constantly ask myself, how will this tool affect how I teach? This semester, it might change the following semester, right? I ask, how will this affect how my students will be affected in how they view my teaching? So there are many levels of metacognition here that is happening. And I think we need to constantly, you know, think about this issue. I, I don't see it as a problem, but I see it as an opportunity for me to improve my teaching, for my students to improve their writing if they have a better understanding of AI tools. We're going to take a quick break. Thanks for listening to the Big Ideas Podcast. Question. Answer. Discussion. If you are passionate about Big Ideas, consider sponsoring this program. To have your name or organization mentioned here, please contact us at ics at bgsu.edu. Welcome back to the Big Ideas Podcast. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Neil Baird and Dr. Kitty Burroughs about ChatGPT and the issues that surround its use in education. So sort of following up on what we've been talking about, what are some of the maybe hallmarks right now that a, an instructor might recognize in a paper that suggests to them that part of the paper was generated through AI? Based on... Our experiences with it, there's certain adverbs or ways of signaling that kind of really suggest that it's generated by an AI, you know, such as, you know, when we asked it to kind of summarize different kinds of articles, it would, you know, there would be transitions such as first it does this, second does this, overall, right? So, you know, very, very school genre kinds of, of things that it produces. For me, my writing assignments for my students, they incorporate a lot of reflective writing. So one of the, an easy way for me to detect AI writing is when the personalization of the writing does not exist in, in the piece that my students generate, right? If the students just give me a, a, a full page of summary with no personal application or experiences incorporated in the writing, you know, I, I wouldn't jump to the conclusion that my students use uh, AI to, to write, but I would encourage my students by asking questions, how about your experiences with this topic? Could you share some examples of how you use some of the concepts or ideas that were brought up in the article, for example? There's a moment, though, where you asked it to do some reflective writing, and you were kind of surprised about how self-referential it was yes. at one point. Yes, it's learning. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. it's <laughs> learning. Yes. One of the questions I have is, you know, I think some of the conversations that happen in college campuses are about kind of the changing student body, right, that we can see kind of the downstream effects of changes that happen at K-12. And we know that, for example, the pandemic really affected kind of mental health and some of the kind of school experiences of a generation of kids, right? I know that there has been concern for a while, even before the pandemic, about the ways in which kind of the use of standardized testing has had a negative impact on students' kind of critical thinking and creative expression, right, in writing, that they've been trained throughout their elementary and secondary education to sort of like spit back what, you know, in ways that work for a multiple choice test, right? Neil, do you have concerns about kind of the use of chat GPT sort of potentially accelerating that with students relying on kind of surface summary? And how are you thinking about making sure that students continue to develop those deeper skills? Right. I do. 
right? Although chat GPT doesn't do so well on standardized tests, I think it scores a two. Both chat GPT-3 and chat GPT-4 both scored two on standardized tests. So so there's that. But I do have that worry, right? And we'll see. You know, a lot of plagiarism cases and issues of academic dishonesty happen near the end of the semester as, you know, uh, students struggle in each of their courses, you know, deadlines loom, those kinds of things. So, you know, I do worry about that. But one of the ways that we're thinking of guarding against that is making students aware of the tool, right, and talking through it and encouraging its use and talking through with students its its ethical use and when is it appropriate to use it and when it's not appropriate to use. And Kitty, how are you thinking about kind of maybe updating assignments and things? You already do a lot of reflective and creative writing that, you know, isn't going to be something they can get from Wikipedia or SparkNotes or whatever. How are you evolving those practices to help students understand kind of what a tool like ChatGPT can help them with and then how they need to take it from there? That's a very good question. I look back at first semester writing courses and how freshly minted freshmen comes into a writing class and how they perceive academic writing. One of the things I have a conversation with the class is that many students take their first writing course not understanding or maybe not valuing what they bring to the table. Students, they are thinking academic is about what I can share in terms of elevated knowledge that is expected at the college level. But I think even before that, students really need to value what they bring to the classroom. Their experiences has meaning to the kind of writing that we teach. We value process. It's important for students to understand what their writing process is and what it looks like when they are taking that first semester writing course or a second semester writing course that evolves around research, right? Even with research writing, students need to not just write a topic about, say, recycling and what everything about recycling has been shared out there in research, but I want to know what their views are right, what their research question are, that unique question that they bring to the table in that conversation about recycling. And that's kind of the difference between the sort of mutt genre yeah. and, and where you're trying to get them to head to. The mutt genre is the just, okay, you know, synthesize, find five sources, synthesize them, and then give that back to me, when that's not actually what we want writing for. Yes. Right? I mean, right. even journalism, like, is persuading us of something, is trying to tell us how to understand this thing. Yeah. So, Neil, yeah, how are you thinking about these things? In, yeah, so I think making your assignments as specific and connected to your learning outcomes as possible, I think is something to really think through, right? So, for example, one of our standard assignments in RIT 1120 is an annotated bibliography, right? So I asked ChatGPT, uh, could you give me an annotated bibliography in APA format with 10 sources about police report writing, and it couldn't do that. Mm. But then I asked it, what would be 10 sources I could use in my paper on police report writing in APA? And it could give me 10 sources, right? And then I took one of those sources and and gave ChatGPT the title of it, and could you annotate this for me? And it could, right? Although across our experiences, there's some, you know, differences in how well chat GPT annotated something, right? But for for an example, in terms of making your assignments more specific, if I just said to students, annotate, right, then they could easily draw upon chat GPT to help them complete that assignment. But I have specific requirements for my annotation. So the assignment essentially is annotate 10 sources, but your annotations need to do X, Y, and Z, where X, Y, and Z are really connected to my learning outcomes for that assignment, right? And 
chat GPT can't give me that kind of an annotation, right? So that's just an example of making your assignments as specific as possible and connected to your learning outcomes. It sounds like part of what you're advocating is a move to sort of building in some of these tools as part of the repertoire in that process, but it's going to be more early stage work rather than kind of the more advanced. Is that Yes, it would, I would say it's more pre-writing as opposed to the drafting process, right? So just to add another example to research writing, one of the things my students do is primary research, meaning they have to come up with a survey or interview questions and interview someone on campus. So one of the things we did was a couple of weeks ago, as a class, I told the students, let's explore what ChatGPT can teach us about creating a survey or questions on your topic. So they, the students bring to the classroom uh, samples, surveys about their topic or questions related to their topic. And then we talk about how can we personalize the survey questions or the interview questions that ties into their specific research question for the semester, right? Instead of using a generic one, but tying it to learning outcomes or their personalized research question. Yeah, I've, I've seen that as well. It's very generative, very inventive. In terms of research methods, I've asked GPT, okay, so I want to research police report writing. What would be a list of 10 research questions that I might ask about police report writing and gave me a list of 10, right? So it's a place to start for yeah. my research question. It can really help exactly. maybe students sort of who aren't quite sure where to begin. Yeah. It could be a useful tool to get those juices flowing. Yeah, exactly. yeah. I, even, I even asked it. So I want to do an empirical study on police report writing. How might I go about doing that empirical study? And it said, you know, you can use focus groups and do this. You can use interviews and do this. You can use surveys and do this. You know, you can do these kinds of observations. So, you know, it was really great and even kind Know, suggesting possibilities for approaching primary research. So, you know, that's the, one of the most exciting things for me about it is the way it can, can generate possibilities, right? Uh, places to start for students. I really think that this is a real opportunity for teachers, you know, specifically, you know, teachers in our writing program. It's, it's a great time to redesign our writing assignments where we value our students' prior experiences, what they bring to the classroom, right? Teaching our students that you are not just a blank slate. You bring to the classroom so many wonderful ideas. How can we enhance these ideas to your study here at BGSU, right? And, you know, help students understand this new technology that is here to stay. Kitty, could you recommend, are there any resources for students and professors that you would suggest are great places to go if folks want to learn more about the technology in general or are ways it can be productively used? I know there has been seminars, or rather webinars, via a Chronicle of Higher Education. They can register for those webinars and learn more about what's being discussed, what, what's the conversation at this point in time. Our program had a meeting and we have created two documents. One is a living document where we continue to add links to resources out there. As we learn more about it, we add these links for our teachers. Yeah, and we, we just started curating a list of sources, you know, from such sources as Chronicle of Education, Inside Higher Education, those kinds of things since November when ChatGPT came on the scene to present day, right? We have, you know, links to other AI tools other than ChatGPT. Like I, I think Google is coming out with its own called Bard of all things. And so I thought that was interesting. And then it also has, you know, link to position statements in our field as well as a, a Canvas module that folks in writing studies created to help faculty members introduce their students to ChatGPT and other AI. AI tools. We are at a time where this conversation about generative AI is still in the early stages. So, uh, you know, there are many conversations on this topic. I would recommend immersing ourselves in, in the conversation and 
see what you know different scholars and teachers are saying about this AI tool. Kitty, would you tell us what is the current UWP policy about the use of these technologies? The current policy is that we should look at AI as something that's here to stay, but we can learn a lot from AI. But there are appropriate ways to use text generated by AI, right? We want to teach our students how to do it ethically, right? We definitely do not recommend students to just copy and use the information generated through ChatGPT in their work. They can certainly use it as a pre-writing tool and learn from it. And I'm starting, for me personally, I'm, I'm looking into how can students share what they are using from ChatGPT in writing about their process, their writing process, and to cite it. Right? You know, my students in research writing are already generating information of how they are using some information from ChatGPT and how that has learned their writing process to evolve over time, over the, the semester. So citing the information and text from AI and saying, this is part of my learning process and, and to do it ethically. Neil, where do you think maybe the policy might go in the future? Any thoughts about kind of where we might be heading? Yeah, I think a lot of where we might be heading needs to be determined by just learning more about student use of it, right? You know, for example, when I was working with ChatGPT, I asked it to give me a thousand-word empirical research report that examines how uh, police officers write police reports, and it couldn't do that, right? But I asked it give me an introduction to an empirical research report that investigates how police reports are written, and it could, right? So I could see students using ChatGPT to write portions of their essay, right? But it also means thinking as a faculty, as instructors, how do we feel about that, right? You know, is it on the same level as, like, Google rewriting passages of our text and us just selecting that to make it more concise, right? If if students begin with what ChatGPT produces, but then deeply revises it for their own purpose, is that okay, right? We just don't know enough about how students are using it. And, and once we know more, then we can develop appropriate policies that sort of uh, protect the learning that we want to happen in our writing courses. Anything else you'd like to add about this conversation? You know, places to direct folks or things we haven't touched on that you think are important for listeners to understand kind of the context? Yes, I would say for instructors, don't be intimidated. Think of bite-sized chunks that you can digest at the moment in, in, you know, whatever time you have, right? Trust your own expertise, Right? Look into how we can use this technology to help our students learn and how to help us teach better. Right? I would say too that we should look at GPT as an opportunity. This is really a great time to advance what we do, whether it is in writing, in math, in music, in the STEM program, right? Reach out to faculty members for conversations within your program or department, because I think it's important to do that and to learn the nuanced discussions and what it can bring to our understanding of AI in higher ed. No, I would just, you know, in the university writing program, many of us take a writing about writing approach. You know, we understand that writing is an object of study in addition to a process that we push forward. And many of us ask students to develop research projects on writing, right? And I just really encourage faculty and and others to, you know, explore this in research with students, right? You can give them a series of Chronicle of Higher Ed, Inside Higher Education, to help them understand the conversation that's going on uh, about chat GPT and AI-generated text. But wow, develop a research project that invites them to learn how faculty members use it. And we have faculty members who actually have used it to write policy statements on their syllabus, right? Or, you know, if if a student is going into the field of law enforcement and justice administration, right? 
are the are police officers using it in in particular ways? Are are chemists using it in particular ways? Like how are professionals using it, right? And then learning from their peers about how they use it. I just I think there's a whole range of really interesting research projects that students can push forward, helping not only us but themselves understand this tool that's going to have a major impact on how we teach writing moving forward. So I sort of have two thoughts about that Mm -hmm. that I'd love to maybe our kind of sort of final digression. So one is on the subject of it as a tool. It really reminds me of I'm old enough to have first learned to type on a typewriter, but all of my actual writing was on a computer. Right. Like I I, I learned that the next semester, everything was sort of computer based. And so I think about the consternation some folks felt about how different it would be to cut and paste to edit as you write, as opposed to you handwrite or hand type a total draft and then go back and revise. And yet... I, I certainly don't long for the days where I would have had to type out hundreds of pages and then figure out how to revise. Like that is right. a process that like the tool evolved the way we write, right? Yes. The tools changed our processes. And so it seems to me that like what you're talking about is this will just, will need to evolve and this may very well become a major part of most people's writing process in some way. And that's not something to be afraid of. It's just something to figure out. Right. Right, exactly. Writing is evolving, and it is unique to each individual. No two individuals write the same way, right? So I think of that creative element that we try to inculcate in our students, right? There's no one way to do something, right? This is time to be creative, whether you are a student working on your own writing or a teacher, you know, you can be creative about how you design your assignments, your course, and all of us can benefit from having a little bit more creativity. Yeah, like I've been reading articles that sort of highlight that ChatGPT is really good at writing, you know, letters of application, right? (laughs) You know, is there worth in not having to start at ground zero when you're writing a genre? Can you have it produce it and then make it your own? And is, is that bad? I think those are the kinds of questions that we need to start asking ourselves, right? And certainly what you're talking about in the context of UWP courses is applicable to, Mm -hmm. you know, we all write all the time in whatever fields we work in, right? Whether you're sending Mm -hmm. emails, writing reports or memos or, Right. right, like, and having this as another tool in the arsenal is going to benefit everyone who does any kind of writing as a part of their day-to-day life. Yeah. Right. You know, I'm teaching a history of rhetoric class this semester. And, you know, Plato was very much against, you know, writing and what impact it might have on oral culture. Right. So I understand the fears and anxieties, but these kinds of things happen at, at important points where there's a, a watershed moment that might impact how we're using existing tools like writing. So this is sort of the the optimistic side, right? Yeah. Kind of yes. the opportunities here. Yes. Maybe I do want to sort of question a little bit of caution too, mm-hmm. because one of the things that these tools do is they are incorporating massive content that exists out there. Yes. And a lot of that content includes, right, misinformation, disinformation, racist, xenophobic, all sort, you know, some of the worst parts of our written culture, yes. right? And parts of the mm-hmm. internet and things. How are you thinking about addressing over time sort of those elements as well. So not just that the tool can generate text, but also that it's going to be generating text based on not just the, you know, vetted sources, not just on, you know, quality publications, but from all sorts of things. So how does that feed into the way you think about As an optimist, Mm -hmm. I am already having conversations with my students about Let's take a look at some AI generative text out there. Let's explore, uh, are there biases? Is it accurate, right? Because we need to teach our students how to view all kinds of information that is at our fingertips. They are not all accurate, right? There are biases and incorrect information. So this is really a great time to introduce our students to how do we evaluate information, right? We are not going to have less information in the future. We're going to have more fake news, (laughs) fake voices, (laughs) right? Fake images. 
how are we going to assess what's being fed to us? I think this is a great opportunity for us as educators to work with our students and help them learn what's out there and how to assess information. I think one of the things that I'm trying to do is see what chat GPT produces through the lens of diversity, equity, inclusion, and access, right? So, well, number one, it was really interesting when I asked it to develop a series of research questions on a research project. There were one or two that really acknowledged diversity, inclusion, equity, access, right? But not all of them did. So having conversations with students about what do these questions assume, right? What do they not assume? Those kinds of things I think are really important. And also the same thing if you ask ChatGPT to generate research design or interview questions, focus group presence, survey questions, right? You know, having conversations with students, okay? You know, it says you can use surveys in this way, but how are you going to target, you know, a robust and diverse population of students to survey, right? What do these interview questions assume about who you're interviewing, right? So I think approaching these things through the lens of diversity, equity, inclusion, and access will be really key to helping, you know, us understand not only ChatGPT, but how we can use what it produces effectively in our writing. Thanks so much for joining me today. It's been great talking with you both. Thank you. Thank you. Listeners can keep up with ICS by following us on Twitter and Instagram at ICSBGSU and on our Facebook page. You can listen to Big Ideas wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Please do subscribe and rate us on your preferred platform. For more information or to propose a guest for a future episode, visit us at bgsu.edu forward slash bgideas. Sound engineering for this episode was provided by Caitlin Herman, Marco Mendoza, and Brendan Akatora. Research for this episode was by Joe Elia.